All right, today we are doing the second session on Paul the Apostle and the Pauline Epistles. Today we're going to talk about Romans, Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, Philippians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, and Titus. And if we have time, we, we might do something else. Okay, um, these, well, let, me, let me just get into that. This is the, the course that we're, uh, we're following. Today we're on week five, it's hard to believe that we're halfway through the, the course. So the Pauline epistles, uh, second, next week we will deal with the general epistles they're called, which means the epistles that were not written by Paul, basically, Hebrews through Jude. And then the seventh week we will deal with the book of Revelation and expectations for the fulfillment of the promised return of Jesus. And then the last week we will do a New Testament conclusion and the final exam. And that will be on the 4th of March. Again, not meeting next week. If anybody doesn't get that, it's because you're not paying attention. <laughs> All right. Um, Paul, the Apostle Paul, once again, a number of images of Paul. Um, this is, we, we looked at the first, second, and third missionary journeys of Paul, and we also looked at his arrest and the trip to Rome as separate things last week. And if you go online, the notes are all up there, the PowerPoint slides, you can see those individual maps. This is a map that puts them all together. And the reason I'm doing this today is because there are a number of cities that you might want to know. Of course, here is the Holy Land, Jerusalem, Samaria, Caesarea, Damascus, Antioch, which was the a home base for Paul and, and Barnabas and Silas, Tarsus, which was Paul's hometown, that's where he came from, this area here, which was known as Asia Minor, uh, the part of it was called Asia, very confusing, but like I've said before, it's, it's, we have North America, within North America there's the United States, within the United States we may refer to the, the Great Northwest, within the Great Northwest there's the, the state of Washington or the state of uh, Oregon in, in Washington State, we talk about Western Washington and then, you know, so, this, kind of, this way of dealing with different names for geographical areas should not seem that foreign to us because we do exactly the same thing. But this area, which was known as Asia Minor, we know of today as Turkey. This area, the northern part of which we call Macedonia, down here was Achaia. This is what we know of as Greece. And of course you should recognize Italy, which has always been called Italy, or for, you know, for the, any history we would concern ourselves with biblically. Um, and, of course, you have Rome here. Now, some of the places that, that I wanted to put this map up for, Rome, obviously, we're going to deal with Romans today, with Ephesians, Ephesus is right here. Um, Colossae, which is where the Colossian letter was written to, is not on this map because Colossae was not a big town. In fact, the trip that Carolyn and the Hansons um, and I and the, a bunch of other people we met went on recently to visit the six of the seven um, tribes, uh, tribes, churches that are mentioned in Revelation, we stayed in Colossae, but there was nothing there to see. Because in its day, Colossae was a fairly small town, and it had been overshadowed by Herapolis and Laodicea, which is right here. These are, these are right close to it. Um, and so it was not of particular significance. And that day it had a pretty thriving church that Paul writes to in the book of Colossians, but other than that, there's not a lot to it. So you don't often see it even listed on maps, unless there are maps of, here's where Paul wrote letters to. So we've got Laodicea, Ephesus I mentioned. Um, Timothy was in Ephesus when Paul wrote 1st and 2nd Timothy. And Titus was on Crete, the island of Crete, when he wrote to it. So as we talk about these various letters today, I wanted you to be able to see some of the different locations that he wrote to. Corinth, we talked about last week. Um, Thessalonica, we talked about last week. The, the, the Thessalonians, oh, and Philippi, up here in the north. Um, this is Europe. Okay, and you hear a lot about Troas, which is right here on the coast. Troas is where they kept leaving from to go over to Neapolis, which was the port city of Philippi, and to visit Corinth and Athens and Berea, Thessalonica, Philippi. This is Asia. This is Europe. So the vision that Paul had when he was in Troas was to come across, a man of Macedonia saying, come across to Europe and help us because we need to hear the, the good news. So that gives you kind of a perspective. In here you see all of these lines are sort of doubled over. The, you'll notice the dotted line, the dotted red line is the first missionary journey. The second missionary journey is the solid uh, line, the purple line. The blue line is the third missionary journey. 
<coughs> and the dotted uh, that goes this way, the orange dotted, is taking him to Rome when he was arrested. You can't figure that out from where you're sitting. But one of the reasons I have this up here is just to point out where some of those cities are, but also so that this is now on the PowerPoint slides that you can go in and print out. Because if you print it out, then you can read it. Okay? Just wanted you to get a sense of the cities we're talking about. Right in here, where all of these lines double over, that's where you get Derby and uh, Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, uh, Pisidium. These are the churches of Asia that Paul talks about, the Galatian churches that he founded in his first missionary journey and then went back to visit later. So they were very important. He kept going back there, and so you see a lot of activity in terms of dotted lines and stuff in there. Any questions about that? Rich? On, I don't know, the second or the third journey, it said Paul, uh, that it was about 3,500 miles, and that Paul walked most of it. How could a guy walk that far? Well, slowly. <laughs> Um, in those days, they were they were accustomed to that. I mean, that's how they traveled. You had three ways of traveling. You either uh, took a bus. No, just kidding. <laughs> you either took a boat, or you rode a mule. You would not ride a horse because anytime Scripture talks about a horse, that's a sign of, of war. That's a military. Horses were only used for wartime. They were used to pull chariots, but other than that, if they were ridden, they were only ridden by soldiers. So it would have been a mule or a donkey that he might have ridden. So you'll notice how many of these lines are out in the water, okay? Because if you were going some distance, a boat was an easier way to get there. They didn't have commercial boats, but what you would do is you would book passage on a, a merchant vessel. On a, uh, I mean, when I say commercial boats, they didn't have uh, commercial passage. You know, there weren't, uh, there weren't cruise lines. There weren't, you know, passenger vessels. So you would book it on a, on a, a merchant ship, a cargo ship to get where you're going. Yeah. And quite a few of these things happen that way. But Paul also, from Tarsus, he would have crossed through what's called the gates of Cilicia through these mountains here, and would have walked, you know, most of this would either have been walking or he would have been on probably on a mule back part of the time. But yeah, they walked thousands of miles. Yes? What about Judy? camels? They didn't use camels in this area. Camels are much more uh, a warm weather uh, kind of thing. And this, I mean, these mountains here are snow-capped uh, much of the year. So this was not really camel air, uh, territory. Um, camels would have been more down Egypt, down in the hot areas, down in the deserts in Arabia and things like that. They may have had some camels, um, like coming from the east into um, the, the Holy Land or Palestine. But for the most part, you know, cam camels would not have been up in here because they're hot weather animals. Uh, Istanbul is up on the Black Sea? Istanbul is right there. Yeah. And it's not even listed on this map. You see that little line there? That's called the Bosphorus. It is the channel which goes between the Black Sea and down here in uh, basically into the Mediterranean. All right? um, and so uh, Istanbul straddles two continents. It's the only city in the world that's true of. It's, half of it's in Europe, half of it's in Asia. And there, there's now bridges that you can go across, but they used to do everything by boat. And we've walked across those bridges, so it's not that far. So, other questions about this part of it? Shoe business must have been really good. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> the shoe business. Sandals. Yeah, Sandal lots, of, business lots business. of sandals. You know, it didn't take a lot of work to put a piece of leather with some straps on it, I don't think. Um, so, you get a good idea, I think, of where, where we're talking about there. Uh, this is a, a list that I gave you last week. You will notice that. This is not in order in which they're listed in the Bible. The listing in the Bible is based upon length. Romans is the first of the Pauline epistles of the Bible because it's the longest. We're going to talk about it today. But the first one written was Galatians, unless you're a, a, you know, a northern Galatian theorist, and I'm going to show you something on that in a second. But Galatians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, we talked about last week after we did a, a general overview of Paul and his life. Today we're going to pick up with Romans and the rest. I have another, um, another slide here, a couple more slides here for you. This slide, which I'm not going to get into today, but again, part of the reason I put these slides up here is so you can go on to the website and print these out. You have the content. Each, this will tell you the major themes or focus of each of the Pauline epistles. And then this one, this chart, will show you uh, where, in terms of Paul's <coughs> life and the history of what's going on, the um, 
the events occurred. You will notice this is AD 48 going across to AD 95. The first missionary journey to Galatia, and then this is Galatians, written at Antioch, and it gives you dates, 49-ish. Uh, you know, 40, and then the Jerusalem Council occurs, and then the second missionary journey, you have first and second, second Thessalonians written about that time from Corinth, when Paul was visiting there. The third missionary journey to Asia, and this will tell you where the missionary journeys went to. Asia being part of Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. He wrote, uh, during this time period, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. This says Galatians, that says Galatians. This is if you believe that he wrote it to the, the first churches that he visited in the first missionary journey. This is if you believe that he traveled north. Remember, we talked about that, the northern Galatian theory. That would put Galatians later. I don't think that's right. Check that out. I think this is right. But they put them both on here because there is a there is this difference of opinion about that. To me, Galatians doesn't make any sense here, being uh, you know several years after the Jerusalem Council, because Galatians talks about the very issue of whether or not you need to be circumcised, and the Jerusalem Council definitively decided that question. If they had done that before he wrote Galatians, then I feel certain Paul would have said. And by the way, James and the Council of Jerusalem all agree that you don't have to do this. He never says that. All right. So that's why I don't think it goes here. I think it goes there. You then have Romans. We are going to pick up here today with the rest of these. These we dealt with last week. You get, he's arrested. Uh, he writes the book of Romans from Corinth. He gets arrested and taken to Rome, the first Roman imprisonment. And we have what's called the prison letters, which we'll talk about. We believe that these four letters were written by Paul while he was in prison in Rome. They are um, Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, and Philippians. Then, we believe Paul was released from Rome, although that is not recorded specifically anywhere. Um, the book of Acts ends with his, imprisonment, his first imprisonment in Rome. But all tradition in the church and sort of assumptions we can make from the letters that came later, like 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus, is that he did have a fourth missionary journey where he visited Crete, he visited Ephesus again, he ended up going probably to Spain, we talked about that last week, and then returning back, and we tradition has it that he was arrested in Troas, remember that city on the coast of Asia Minor, from which they would keep sailing over to, to Neapolis and Philippi and all that, that he was arrested in Troas, taken again to Rome, uh, was tried, convicted, and executed in Rome. But we believe that uh, the result, during that fourth missionary journey, he wrote first and sec first Timothy and to Titus right about the same time. Then he was imprisoned in Rome again, and it was while he's imprisoned in Rome, he wrote Second Timothy. Um, and again, the reason why we have these, this general dating of 68 is nowhere in Paul's writing does he refer to the destruction of Rome. To a Jewish writer, even a Jewish Christian, the destruction of Rome would be like the whole east coast of the United States had been destroyed. It's not something, what's that? Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem, what did I say? Rome. 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 I'm sorry. Yeah, Rome was destroyed. At least not then, not until 400. Uh, but in 70 AD, Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. For, for any writer to not have mentioned that, any Jewish writer, especially, um, to not have referred to that in some way. St. Augustine, for instance, um, in the 4th century when Rome was destroyed, he wrote the book, The City of God, because people all over the world, including Christians, thought that the world was coming to an end and that there was no way to understand this in terms of God's providence. For somebody like Paul to have not mentioned the destruction of Jerusalem and how that fit into God's plan would be unheard of. And so that's why we don't believe anything was written later than 67, and we believe that he probably was executed in 68 in Rome. Okay? This gives you a good timeline, what Paul was doing on the top, what books that he wrote on the bottom. Um, hopefully you'll find that helpful. I do. And also, you know, the details I didn't get into, where he was, we believe, where he was when he wrote these various things, dates, and that sort of stuff. Questions about that? Okay. I love this kind of thing. You know, that's why that's why I really like that book. You know the, the Nelson's uh, maps and stuff. Okay. Um, let's talk about the Book of Romans. Now, does the Book of Romans does it follow a timeline also, like as you give to the 
end of Romans, you're into the uh, eight, whatever, seventy, or what is it, sixty-nine, seventy? Or well, not, not, uh, no. Uh, the the Book of Romans is just written at, at a time. When we have like circa AD fifty-six or fifty-seven, we believe it was written some time in there. Yeah. But it wasn't written over a long period of time. Okay. It was written, you know. Paul sat down in the afternoon and dictated this. We even know who his, who his amanuensis or secretary, scribe, was. His, his name was Tertius, because Paul allows him to identify himself because he knew some of the recipients. Uh, but no, it's not that the book of Romans covers a range of time. All of these books were written either in one sitting or you know within, within a few days of each other, probably. They're just, um, we have ranges because we're not sure exactly when that date occurred, okay? So there doesn't, it doesn't appear to be a timeline in Romans showing the first imprisonment and the second. No, no. The book of Romans was he was not even in Rome at the time. In fact, when when Paul wrote the book of Romans, he had not yet visited Rome. Romans was written from Corinth to the church in Rome. So it's, it, make sure you're clear on that. Um, the titles of these letters is not where Paul was when he wrote it. It is who he's writing to. So we believe that. Paul would have written the, the book of Romans from Corinth when he was visiting there. He had not yet visited Rome. In fact, he mentions that a couple of times in his letter. I'm looking forward to being able to visit you at some point. Well, unfortunately, he was under, uh, in prison when he got there. Oh. I think it might be. Um, I think it might be the plug. I was still. <laughs> I cited Felina Do we lose a ball? No, wait, wait. Yeah, so we just needed to jiggle. It wasn't plugged in all the way. Yeah. Remind. Yeah, that's it. Sorry, the plug wasn't in all the way. And you kicked it. No, I'm just kidding. You did, I saw it. It's your fault. No, I kicked it. Crucify him. No. Yeah. Kick it again, it's not safe yet. <laughs> Yeah, that should be coming up. Okay. Um, so, make that point again. Well, the screen comes up. The, um, the writing is not, the titles of the books are not where they were written from, it's where they were written to. Okay? They don't seem to be coming up yet. The light's on. I wonder if. But nobody's. I took the Super Bowl 33 minutes to do it. Oh. It smells like it might be the bowl. It's like the lights going out in the Super Bowl. That's right. It's like the Super Bowl. Everybody on my lap, we can watch it from here. <laughs> well, all I can do is wait and see if that comes up. I don't have a bullet stick in there. So. so I may just have to gesticulate wildly as I talk about this stuff. Wait. So, let's talk about the Book of Romans. Uh, if anybody has a computer, you can sign on and look at this while I'm talking about it. <coughs> As Marvin says, look over your shoulder. Um, sorry about that. Book of Romans. Um, Paul wrote this. It really is Romans. is not only the longest letter, but in one way it's appropriate that it comes first in his letters because it is the most important of the epistles he wrote theologically. Uh, it, it, and I say that because it's the most comprehensive it's the most logical presentation of the gospel. Probably Romans and Ephesians are the two most significant in terms of their messages to us. Um, and if you've read through the materials in the Max book, it talks about the fact that Augustine in the 4th century uh, became a Christian by reading, was converted by reading the book of Romans. It was a significant book. Romans was the book probably more than anything else that caused Martin Luther to really rethink how it is we're saved. Uh, in, a, in a very different kind of orientation than what the Catholic Church was maintaining at the Reformation. Uh, it's also a book that was very, very significant to John Wesley. I see the red light. Would you push yeah. that button again and see the, the big button toward the front? Yes. That red light may mean that the bulb is out. Sorry. In fact, it probably does. Yeah. Um, this particular book of Romans, um, Paul is concerned, the, the theme of Romans, the thing that we can identify as being the most significant part of this message is God's righteousness. In fact, the, if you could see the screen, it would tell you that there are really three sections of Romans, all three of which deal with God's right, righteousness. The first section, which is the first eight chapters, 
is the revelation of God's righteousness. And Paul particularly makes a point of the fact that the, um, the Jewish people, neither the Jewish people nor the Gentile people are righteous before God. But in fact, that all humanity is sinful before God. All humans have fallen short of God's righteousness. But God has revealed that righteousness to us, first to the Jews in the law, and they were unable to, to meet the goal of that righteousness. And then the righteousness of God was demonstrated in the, the presence of Jesus Christ. In fact, the first eight chapters is the revelation of God's righteousness. The chapters 9 to 11 is the vindication of God's righteousness. That vindication of God's righteousness is the presence of uh, Jesus Christ as being the very incarnation, literally, of God's righteousness and the fact that through Christ, his, God's righteousness is imputed, uh, imputed to us. So all the theme goes around this idea of righteousness. And then uh, the last uh, chapters 12 through 16 deal with the application of God's righteousness and how that is supposed to change us. Some of the major themes that come through the book of Revelation are um, faith, law, sin, and obviously righteousness. In fact, each of those words appear uh, some 60 times in the letter to the Romans. Someday I'm going to preach through Romans. Someday if I feel like God will give me another 10 years or so. Uh, because there is so much there. It is a huge book. Now to understand really what Paul is dealing with in Romans, you have to know a little bit about the city of Rome. The city of Rome, and again, Paul had not yet visited there, but there were Christians in Rome. Apparently there were quite a few Christians in Rome. Tacitus, the historian, said that when Nero started persecuting the Christians, that there were an immense multitude of them in AD 64. That's when, uh, when Nero decided to blame the Christians for the fact that he wanted to rebuild Rome the way he wanted it, so he had it set on fire and burned the significant part of it. But he needed to blame somebody for that, so he blamed the Christians because they were an easy group to point out and to, to persecute for that. But when Paul is writing the letter to the Romans, uh, Rome probably had about a million in population. Approximately one-third of those were probably slaves or even more. Um, and it was, it was an unbelievably modern city for 2,000 years ago. They had multi-story buildings that were quite magnificent. They had indoor plumbing. They had aqueducts that brought fresh water throughout the city. So they had fresh water and sanitation when most parts of the world simply didn't. And so it was a very modern city. There was also, the church had grown significantly, probably starting with Pentecost, when, pe when Jews from Rome would have been in Jerusalem and heard Peter's sermon, the first great sermon of the church, when the church was, was birthed, had gone back to Rome and spread this good news. Ah, uh, speaking of good news. <laughs> Marvin, you did it. Does anybody have any ailments? Marvin can touch them. And, uh, uh, <laughs> Cast it out too. Oh, there you go. No, don't do that. We can eat it. Now, um, so the church had been planted, not by Paul. Paul did not plant the church in Rome. Been planted by other Jews. And so at first, the church in Rome, like almost everywhere else, except for Antioch and the places that, you know, in, in the Gentile Asia Minor, that Paul planted, Paul and Barnabas and Silas and Luke, the church in Rome had started out as a Jewish church, Jewish believers who came to believe that Jesus was the Messiah that had been promised, and then realized that he was something more than that. But interestingly, in AD 49, which is just about, we believe, as you'll see the dates here, we believe was probably only about seven or eight years prior to Paul writing this letter to the Roman church, um, the, the emperor Claudius, you guys saw I, Claudius, the UBS special, that Claudius, okay, Claudius had had expelled all of the Jews from Rome because he kept being told there were, that these Jews were causing all sorts of problems. Um, the claim was that these Jews, it sounds like the Jews and the Jewish Christians were fighting and there were problems and so Claudius' answer was throw them all out. So he threw all of the Jews and the Jewish Christians out of Rome what that meant was, at that point, the only Christians that were there were Gentile Christians. Now, the, the, the expulsion of the Jews from Rome didn't last very long. People started coming back fairly quickly. But initially, they were all forced out. And so Paul, when you read the, the, the letter to the Roman church, 
there's this weird kind of blend where there are times he seems like he's talking to Jewish Christians because he deals with Jewish law, etc. But there are other times he's clearly talking to Gentile Christians because uh, by the time he's writing this, some of the Jewish Christians had gone back, but the leadership was probably all Gentiles because they had to fill in the gap when all of the Jewish Christians were forced to leave. Because when, when Claudius expelled the Jews, he expelled the Jewish Christians too because the Romans thought they were all one thing. He thought it was just a splinter group. They're all Jews. So he expelled them all, Gentile leadership, and Paul is writing specifically to the leadership, uh, well, he's writing the whole church, but specifically acknowledging the leadership who were Gentiles of the Roman church at that time. But he also brings in quite a bit of reference to the Jewish heritage, which means within the, within the time period from AD 49 to 56 or 57, the Jews had started returning. So you get a little bit of that history there. Um, as I said, this is the most theological of all of, uh, the most theologically complete of all of Paul's writing, and, and almost certainly the most theologically complete of any New Testament uh, book, in that it lays out completely the insufficiency, the sinfulness of humanity, of all human beings, whether they be Jewish or Gentile, the inability of the law of the Jews or anything else to give us righteousness, that righteousness comes only in Jesus Christ, and he deals with how it is that the righteousness of God, or righteousness from God, as he often says, is, is made available to us. A couple of key verses here. Romans 1, 16 and 17, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. You see the, the balance there. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God. Remember, that's the theme of Romans. is righteousness from God or righteousness of God, which means basically the same thing. Righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. You begin to see where Martin Luther you know, took inspiration from this, the idea of faith alone, you know, sola fide, as a, one of the cries of the Reformation. He also emphasized strongly the book of Ephesians, Ephesians 2, for by grace you are saved through faith. Uh, it is a free gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So these two great, the, probably the greatest of the theological books, uh, certainly of Paul and probably of the whole New Testament, were books that significantly influenced the Reformation. Augustine uh, was also influenced by Ephesians as well as Romans. Romans caused him to believe in Jesus. Um, so then Romans 3, 21 to 26. Notice this righteousness from God again, twice. But now a righteousness from God apart from the law has been known, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Him as a sacrifice of atonement through justice in His blood. He did this to demonstrate His justice because in His forbearance He had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. So righteousness of God as represented in the person of Jesus Christ which can be imputed to us or given to us, you know, placed in us, for our salvation. This is the theme of the book of Romans. Questions about that? Mary. Um, could you elaborate on uh, he left the sins committed beforehand unpunished? Um, I think Paul is referring there, and I'd, I'd have to dig in you know, more specifically into it, but I think what he's talking about there is the those who were under the law and were unjustified by the law. <laughs> The, the Jews who had existed under the law but did, were not able to complete the expectations of the law and so therefore um, were unpunished at that point, wait, awaiting the righteousness of Jesus Christ. There's a mysterious little section in Romans 1 and 2 where Paul talks about those who, basically says those who live according to the law will be judged according to the law kind of thing. Now, it's not consistent with everything else he said to say, oh, the Jews are fine. Don't worry about the Jews. They'll be okay. They've got their own covenant. They've got their own, you know, it's not a two-covenant kind of thing. That's not Reformed theology. We don't believe that's the case. But Paul suggests that there is some other special kind of understanding that we should have for how God relates to the Jewish people. And again, nobody is saved except through Jesus Christ, but there's some other kind of a serious thing that Paul's referring to there in the first and second chapter of Romans. Okay? And I think that he's talking here about 
uh, demonstrating his justice because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did not destroy the Jewish people. Okay, they're still there. So in that regard, they were unpunished. How God is going to deal with that, Paul, I don't think, Paul doesn't elucidate. I'm not sure if even he knew. So, but, yeah. does, but does that mean only the Jews or other people? I don't know. I'd have to dig into that into that verse a little more specifically. Maybe I can do that before we meet again and, and see. It's a good question. Anybody else have any insights on that? Romans is a huge theological book. Okay, um, Karl Barth taught a class on Romans for 10 years. So when I said, that was my comment, when I have 10 years, when I think there's going to be 10 more years, then I might preach on it. Uh, preaching on it is even harder because you can't deal with as much preaching as you do teaching. So there's an enormous amount of content in this. Um, the most complete theological exposition. Uh, and, and some people believe, because Paul suggests in Romans, that he is suffering persecution still in Judea. You know, he, he'd been, he was in Corinth, but he'd been a number of places where he had been assaulted, where he'd been threatened, he was stoned, you know, he had all these things that happened to him. It, it, there's a suggestion in Romans that he might be writing this letter to the Romans not just to encourage them, but that he might be writing this <coughs> as his sort of theological legacy because he didn't know if he was going to live much longer. Okay, and so you get a little bit of that, uh, not fatalism, but just just sort of a, a willingness to accept that if that's what God's going to do, that's fine, but let me make sure I get some stuff down before I go. Mm -hmm. Now, he didn't go that quickly afterwards. He had at least probably 11 years, 10 or 11 years after this. But it, it is his most significant work uh, written from Corinth. Um, something else I was going to say about that. Um, okay, I'll think of it in a minute. Anything else about Romans? Okay, you, you need to spend time in Romans, but make sure you're caught up on your sleep before you do, because you need to be sharp. <laughs> okay. uh, it's, there are parts of it that are, will really press you. Uh, let's talk about the next book in uh, the order of writing, and that would be the book of Ephesians. Not in the order that they're in the scripture, but in the order of being written. I'm going to get that chart out in front of me so that I can... Uh, okay. Probably written A.D. 60 or 61. Well, A.D. 60 to 63 we have here, but I'm trying to see the context. Um, the theme of the book of Ephesians, as I said, Ephesians is probably considered the second only to the book of Romans in terms of its significance as a theological work. Ephesians is a very clear, not quite as formal, not quite as academic presentation of the Christian theology of the New Testament. He deals with how we are saved in Christ is the, the first three chapters of the book, the first half of it, is our position as people saved in Jesus. The second, then the next three chapters is, okay, now what are you supposed to do with that? The practice of being a Christian. So it's a very practical book in that regard. Um, there is some thought, although it's called the letter to the Ephesians, and it says to the church in Ephesus at the start of it, um, this may have actually been a cyclical letter, meaning a letter that Paul wrote, because he doesn't... Um, Romans, in, in, he deals a little bit with specific problems that the church in Romans have, but not a lot. Colossians, he deals almost entirely with the problems the church was having, particularly with heresy. So there's a balance here in terms of... Some of Paul's letters are written to address problems a specific church had. Some of them are written to deal with more generic. Romans has a little bit of that. Romans is mostly a generic kind of, not generic is a bad word, that makes it sound less, to a, a broad, sweeping kind of theological exposition, not particular problems. Ephesians um, deals with larger problems and not any particular problems in the church in Ephesus. And in fact, Paul, um, it's, it's believed that the, um, the fact that Paul does not do a lot of identifying of individuals in the book of Ephesus is one of the indications it may have been a cyclical letter. In uh, one place Paul talks about, in the Colossians, he says, get the letter that I wrote to the Laodiceans and read it. Well, we don't have that letter to the Laodiceans. Some scholars believe that this letter, the, the earliest manuscripts we have of Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, does not have the, the dedication to the church in Ephesus in the start of it. Those come later. So it's believed that Paul may have intentionally written this letter, which we know as the book of Ephesians, 
and intended for it to be sent to multiple churches. And so they put tags on the front of it and said, okay, this one, this copy is to the church in Ephesus. There may have been the same letter which was sent to the church in Laodicea because it doesn't address specific problems in Ephesians or in, the, in Ephesus. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Paul was just saying, here are concerns that are true and need to be addressed with multiple churches, so we are going to send copies of this same letter that I'm writing with, ge with general kinds of theological information to multiple places. And that may be why the early copies don't have the reference to Ephesus, and it may be that this was the letter he was talking about when he said the letter that was sent to the Laodiceans, because Col Colossae and Laodicea are very close to each other. Ephesus is quite a bit further away. So he would have written to the Colossians and said, get the letter I sent to the Laodicea and send somebody over there, you know. Send them to Hokota back and get that letter and bring it back and read that one too. Instead of, you know, go to, you know, uh, I don't know, Moralia and get it, which would have been what it would have been if they are going to Ephesus. All right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But you will hear scholars who claim that this, you know, there's no verification that this is uh, written to, that, to Ephesus. In fact, Ephesians and Colossians are two of the letters that they question. I, should, I mentioned that last week. There are probably six of the 13 letters nobody really questions that Paul wrote them. There are probably seven, and it, it cuts different ways, um, that they question whether Paul wrote them. They say, well, there's differences in vocabulary. They say that Ephesians and Colossians have a lot of words that aren't used anywhere else. For instance, they say that there are like 80 words that, that are used in Greek in Ephesians that don't occur in any of the other letters that are attributed to Paul. They don't mention the fact that Romans, who nobody questions that Paul wrote it, has a hundred words that aren't used anywhere else. So this idea of style is very subjective, and when they use that as the only real criteria for saying, we don't think Paul wrote this, you know, it could be how Paul used his amanuensis, his secretary, from time to time. I mentioned that. It may be that, that Paul or others, Peter may have done this with Mark. They would, they would outline what the points they want to make, and they would say, okay, in this next section, talk about blah, 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 blah. And then the secretary would write it down, and then the person, in this case Paul, would say, yeah, that's good, that's what I wanted to say. But it may have particular stylistic things, use of vocabulary, that might not be as common to Paul as it was to Tertius in the, book, in the case of the book of Romans. Okay? Does that make sense? Yes. Sierra. Um, I'm going to just been confused, but in one of the books, um, when I was reading this again, it was saying um, that on some of the manuscripts, it wrote to the Ephesians, like specifically, like within the body of the right. letter. But then the, some of the other manuscripts had it like as a title to the Ephesian church. Right, and there's some that don't have a reference to that at all. Not at all, okay. And so, the, in fact, the earliest manuscripts, I believe it is, don't have any reference to the Church of Ephesus. And that's one of the reasons that scholars believe this may have been a letter that Paul wrote that was use, would have been useful to multiple churches. And then they just, you know, it's like they put an address on it. Send this one to Ephesus. Send this one to Laodicea. Send this one to whatever. Um, because he intended it to be read by multiple churches. So there so, were like three different types. Of right. Like, okay. It may have been that F, the, the Ephesians or Ephesus was in the title of some. It may have been just in the greeting in some. Or it may not have been there at all. Okay. But again, you hear it, liberal scholars, they'll, they'll look at something like that and they go, Oh, you can't trust this! And I'm going, what does that have to do with anything? There's an obvious explanation for why that might have been. And it's, it's sort of supported by the fact that, that the letter to the Ephesians does not have specific problems related to that church as much as, say, Colossians does or some of the others. Okay? Um, this is... One of the, or the first of the prison epistles. We believe that um, there are four letters, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon, that were written when Paul was in prison the first time um, in Rome, before his release and before his fourth missionary journey. We believe this was written at about the same time as Colossians. Paul is in prison, doesn't have a lot of other stuff to do. People could visit him. He actually was in a house. It was sort of house arrest when he was in Rome. Uh, but he was not allowed to travel. He was not going out anywhere. And so we believe that he wrote this. You'll see the dates are the, the same for Ephesians as they are for Colossians. Um, and very close to the dates that we have for Philippians and Philemon as well. The focus is, uh, is on the relationship of the heavenly Lord Jesus Christ and his earthly body. In other words, how we as God's, as humans who are part of the body of Christ, relate to Jesus who is the heavenly Christ. Um, 
And the purpose is to increase our understanding of God's eternal purpose and grace and God's high goals for the church. Whereas Romans is kind of dry and academic and make sure you understand this, there's much more of a sense of passion kind of thing in Ephesians, which again, I don't think in any way indicates that it wasn't Paul who wrote it, but there's a very different sense that you get from this letter than you do from, and it may be that being in prison, you know, gave Paul a slightly different perspective in terms of how he wanted to communicate about stuff. I can imagine that would probably change how I communicate about stuff, even if the content of my message wasn't fundamentally different. Okay. Um, let's see, where do we? Uh, let's look at the verses. One that I quote all the time, I've quoted it once or twice already this morning, Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. And again, this was something, this along with passages in Romans, is a big part of what led Martin Luther to nail the 95 theses on the, the door of the Wittenberg Cathedral that started the Reformation. For it, it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Again, the first three chapters is our place in Christ, our position in Christ as the body of Christ. And so you get here, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Um, you can see how this would inspire somebody who felt like the, the Catholic Church had been, in the case of Luther, the Catholic Church had been saying, no, you have to follow our rules, you have to be a member of our church. You know, we're the ones that save you by administering grace that is available to the church. And, you know, Paul writes this, and the Luther says, wait a minute, you know, I don't see anywhere in here that the church is the one who has the decision about whether or not you receive the grace sufficiency for salvation. Um, so that's what led really to the Reformation, this and some of the passages in Romans. And then from Ephesians 4, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you. Now remember, the second half, 4, four to 6, is how do you live your Christian life? Um, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Humility, back to that point. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all. And all. <coughs> so this is how you're supposed to now live out your Christian faith. I, uh, the first sermon I ever preached at Lakeside Presbyterian Church, and it's something I've, talked about, I've preached and talked about before, uh, is what does God require of you? I mean, what, you know, what, what does God want? And he really only wants two things. He wants you to be in a relationship with him, one, and then he wants you to act like it. To act like you're in a relationship with an almighty and holy creator God. Those are the two aspects of the book of Ephesians. First, our position in Christ, that God has saved us. He is in a relationship with us through his son Jesus Christ, in whom we move, we live and move and have our being. And then, we need to act like it. Those are the two halves of the book of Ephesians. Okay. Questions about Ephesians. <clears throat> now, the city of Ephesus, I've talked about a couple of times before, the most significant archaeological site in the world today, anywhere. Um, it was a city with a large Jewish population, which we, and a huge pagan population as well. In fact, a bigger pagan population. It was a Hellenized city. There's the extraordinary event in Acts where um, the one of the craftsmen who made silver idols actually says silver shrines is the word they use, and then there were other craftsmen who made various kinds of little little idol dolls and stuff. They get all up in arms because Paul has been Paul spent over two years. It says three years in scripture, but they would always round up, so we think it was somewhere between two and three years. And when he's there, he's preaching that. There is salvation to be found in no one other than Jesus Christ. God is not contained in images made by human hands. So these idols are contrary to God's will. They're not only a violation of the commandments, you know, the second commandment, but they're also contrary to any belief in Jesus Christ. And so Paul is preaching all this stuff. Well, the end result is that the economic livelihood of these guys who made these idols is going down the tubes. So at one point, one of them gets all the others together and raises a ruckus. They go and grab Paul, 
and uh, some well, some of the others that were involved in the church, Paul's followers, and they end up going down to the amphitheater, the theater, and having a multi-hour riot where they are all screaming, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, because one of the guys who was against Paul in, in the Christian teaching was saying, not only will this, is this damaging our livelihood, but it's liable to cause people to stop believing in the goddess Artemis, who was one of the, the primary uh, goddesses throughout the whole Greek-influenced world. In fact, the temple to Artemis in Ephesus was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So it was huge. So they got everybody roused up, not only because it was hurting their, you know, their income, but also because they were claiming they'll start denying the divinity of the goddess Artemis if we let this keep going. So they're all in the amphitheater for hours, apparently, chanting and screaming, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Paul, who is not there at that, he's out, outside, he wants to go in and talk to these people, and his followers won't let him. They've already got a couple of guys in there. And then the... Um, the local, the city clerk comes in and says, guys, if you have a problem with this Paul or any of these other people, then file charges and we'll have, you know, we'll have a trial, but you keep doing this and you're going to be accused of creating a riot and the Romans will be in on us really quick. Because the Roman military let everybody pretty much do their own thing, but one of the things they would not put up with was riots. Well, everybody realized, okay, we, it's not going to do us any good if the Romans come in and start, you know, cracking heads. So they all dissipate and go home. Paul, though, ends up leaving Ephesus because of that, going over to Macedonia again. So the, the church in Ephesus, that was where John the Apostle went, and we believe he took Mary, the mother of Jesus, with him. So there was significance in that. He was sort of the elder statesman, kind of the bishop of that whole Western Asia Minor. Um, Timothy, later on, Timothy, for whom two of these letters were written, became a pastor in Ephesus. There's a huge relationship between the city of Ephesus and the church in Ephesus and all of the characters in the New Testament. Paul, Timothy, John the Apostle, Mother the Mary of Jesus, and on and on. Okay, everybody went through there, had something to do with it. Questions about any of that? Okay, I'm going to take that as a good sign. <laughs> Um, it's a warm afternoon. Let's talk about one more book, and then we will take a break. Uh, yes? Ephesians dealt extensively with predestination, and I talked to you yesterday, and you said we get into it. This is not the time, or later, or... More. Well, we'll probably deal with that in the... Uh, we'll talk about... The, you're in the Wednesday class, too, right? right. Okay, we will deal okay. with that in the soteriology yeah. section. Gotcha. Okay. Um, the soteriology and homargeology. So, which is salvation and sin. Uh, let's talk about the book of Colossians. Uh, again, one of the four prison letters of Paul, written the same time period, uh, 60 to 63, same time period as Ephesians. We, we believe that, you know, Paul could have written one of them on Tuesday and the other one on Thursday, uh, because they're, they're from the same time period, from the same location, but to a church uh, a, a pretty good distance away in Asia Minor. In this case, whereas Ephesians is fairly general in its theology, as is Romans, the book of Colossians deals very specifically with concerns and problems that the church in Colossae was having. Um, Colossians, as the Maps and Charts books talks about, is perhaps the most Christ-centered book in all of the New Testament. The whole focus is Christ, Jesus as the Christ. And it's the first two chapters have to do with the supremacy of Christ, and chapters 3 and 4 have to do with submission to Christ. Do you begin to see a theme here in Paul's letters? He frequently, Philippians, he sort of reverses this, but frequently what he will do is he will establish sort of a theological foundation um, where he, he establishes doctrinal beliefs. And then he comes back around and says, okay, now what does this mean to you? What are you supposed to do with this in your life? He, he did it earlier, as we talked about, the position of the Christian in Christ and then the practice of the Christian life in Ephesians. Here he deals with the supremacy of Christ as the only way to salvation, doctrinally. And then he talks about, and how do you live that out in terms of submitting your life to Christ? So he deals, same kind of theme. What does God want? He wants you to be in a relationship with you, with him, and then he wants you to live like it. So 
Colossians specifically was concerned, or this letter is concerned, with opposing the Jewish and Gnostic false teaching. And I say Jewish and Gnostic, we don't know exactly what this was, because Paul, nor anyone else, says, here's what the Colossians believed, here's what they've been taught by these false teachers. Um, we only can try to suss it out from Paul's response to it. Paul says, okay, here, here's the positive, here's how you should be. From what he says, we can sort of get some sense of what it was they were doing wrong, what they believed that was wrong. It was, as I said earlier, kind of a, a syncretism. Syncretism is when you take things and put them together, whether they ought to be put together or not. It was a syncretism between a legalistic Jewish uh, faith, and remember Galatians, was written against the Judaizers. Those who were claiming, uh, and this is an issue that was supposedly was settled by the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, but the, they were saying that, that if you were a Gentile, you still had to be circumcised, you still had to follow the, all the law of Moses, and not eat pork, and not eat things that slithered on the ground, and don't eat any seafood that doesn't have scales and, and, uh, and fins, etc., etc. So in, in Colossae, apparently some false teachers had come and said you have to follow all of those Jewish rules, Plus, you have to be a recipient of the secret knowledge, which was the gnosis, that idea of there's, a, there's a, a mysterious secret knowledge that was part of the Hellenized beliefs, and that the physical world is bad. You know, Jesus would not have had a physical body because he, the um, physical world is bad, the physical body is bad, spiritual is all that matters, and the goal is to, to get rid of anything physical. And, and various other beliefs, again, that the idea of getting the secret knowledge that was necessary for you to be one of the elect. Being one of the elect was a huge deal to them. And it, they had then taken that and tried to, to merge that with the Christian beliefs that the church in Colossae had gotten uh, from the apostles, from uh, various others who had, who had ministered the gospel to them in the church. So they were a mess. They were a confused mess. So Paul is talking specifically to them. And the supremacy of Christ, the first two chapters, what he's saying basically is, all the rest of this stuff you guys have thought is important, throw it all out because Jesus is the only thing that matters. Jesus, who is the Christ, the Son of the living God, is the only thing that can save you. It is the only thing that matters. Forget all the rest of that. That's the supremacy of Christ part. So he's, he's dealing, but he doesn't say, you're believing this and this and this and this. He only says, here's what you should believe. And so that's why we don't know exactly what their heresy was. As I said before, um, the fact that some of these ideas are part of Gnostic heresy, which really was in full bloom in the second century, so we're talking 50 years plus after this, or 40 years plus after this, some liberal scholars have said, oh, this must have been written much later after Paul was dead and he didn't write it. Well, not necessarily. Those beliefs started somewhere. It may have been right here. Um, so the purpose to exalt Christ is completely adequate, don't need anything else, versus the inadequate heresies that the Colossians have come to believe in. Um, questions about that? Another one you should spend time with. Now, as I said, compared to Ephesus, uh, the church in Ephesus was in one of the major cities in Asia Minor. Uh, if you go there today, you wonder where's the water, because it used to be a port city. Well, the port is all silted in, and you know it's a long way to the water now. But it used to be that from the main amphitheater in Ephesus, there's a roadway that went down, and it went right to the port. It was right there. And so goods were brought in and out of Ephesus between trade between Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, and between Greece, between Rome, other parts of the eastern Mediterranean especially. It was a huge deal. Colossae is an inland town. It never was very big. It never was very significant. At one time, they were known as an agricultural center, uh, but then they got overshadowed by Laodicea and Hierapolis, which is right next to Laodicea. Um, and so there wasn't a whole lot going on. The church had been established there, and the church was important, but uh, there's not even any ruins in, in Colossae now. One of the sad parts about going to visit the seven churches, six of the seven churches, there's nothing in Thyatira either, um, was that there are no churches there now at all. It's only ruins. Turkey is 98% or 99%, depending on who you ask, Islamic. Churches pretty much don't exist. And so there was nobody to maintain those churches, so all they are now are ruins. Some of them are pretty spectacular ruins in Philadelphia and you know um, some of the others, but they're just ruins. Well, there's not even ruins in Colossae. So there's nothing to see. We stayed there. 
you know, at a hotel, not a very good hotel, but, um, and, you know, they had to take us somewhere else to, to view anything because there was nothing there. Okay? Any, any questions? Let's take a break. I've got about two minutes till two. Let's go until, let's say, ten after. I didn't give you the verses. The first verse uh, that's a key verse reflects the first part of that, the supremacy of Christ. The second part reflects our presence in Christ. Uh, the first one is Colossians 2, 9 and 10. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ who is the head over every power and authority. So, Jesus is divine, in other words. And then the, from Colossians 3, 1 and 2. Since then, okay, this is the now, what are you going to do with this? Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. So again, to be in relationship with the Christ who is the, full, the fullness of the deity in bodily form. And then, focus your life. Set your heart, not on things of the earth, but on the things of heaven. Alright? The two halves of the equation for Colossians and for Ephesians, and for a lot of the other stuff that Paul writes, okay? So let's talk about the, the shortest book that Paul wrote. Again, we're doing these in order. We believe this was around the same time, AD 60 to 63, written from prison. This is unlike any of the other books that Paul wrote in that, um, and it's so unusual, and there's no, there's no doctrinal content that anybody believes might have been falsified for any reason. So um, nobody, nobody questions that Paul wrote this. This little book, um, it's, which is only 25 verses, not 25 chapters, 25 verses, it's one chapter, is themed on the fellowship in Christ being the most important of our, of our relationships. It's the superior to any other cultural or social status, as for instance, between a slave and an owner. The purpose of this letter is written to Philemon. Remember, these titles are not... Um, where the people were, or who you're writing about, or who you're writing to. Philemon was a Christian believer who had become a Christian um, in Colossae under Paul's ministry. Philemon, like almost everybody of wealth in those days, owned slaves. That doesn't necessarily mean he was evil. Some slave owners were very kind to their slaves. Some, it was, slavery back then was not racially uh, oriented. It was not like if you were a certain race you were a slave, as in the you know, the United States prior to the Civil War. Um, and some slaves were very well educated. Slaves were tutors. Slaves were doctors. You know, um, the, it was a very different idea of <coughs> slavery. So in this case, Philemon is a Christian believer who owns slaves. One of his slaves, um, uh, Onesimus, had run off and apparently run to Rome. And in Rome, he meets up with Paul. Paul... Onesimus also becomes a Christian, and Onesimus, we, we can assume, comes to Paul and says, I have a problem. I'm a runaway slave. My owner, uh, Philemon, back in you know, Colossae, is also a Christian, but I'm, you know, the penalty for being a runaway slave was death. Could be death. It didn't necessarily have to be. And so uh, Onesimus is asking Paul, what do I do? And Paul's response is, you tell the truth. You, know, you respond honestly. So, but Paul, in telling Anisimus that he needed to go back to Philemon, his, his owner, he doesn't just send it back and says, go back and take your medicine, you know, go back and take the consequences. Instead, he sends a letter with him that starts out with seven verses of thanksgiving for Philemon. He thanks the Lord for Philemon being a fellow brother in the Lord um, and acknowledges the relationship. He then pleads or makes a petition for Anisimus as a slave that he be taken back by Philemon as not just as a slave, he's not saying, you know, don't have him as a slave anymore, but he says he's not just a slave, he's a brother in the Lord. He now believes in Jesus as you do. So take him back, not just as a slave, but as a brother in the Lord. And he tells Philemon, uh, that there's a suggestion in here that Onesimus had done more than just run off. He may have stolen something, he may have done something else. But Paul says, uh, and if, if he owes you anything, if there is any debt, then count it to me. I will pay it. I'll be responsible for it. And because Paul apparently was sort of the spiritual father of both Philemon and Onesimus, 
the hope and even the expectation. I mean, Paul induces a little guilt thing here, I think, that, that uh, Philemon owes something to Paul, and so he wants him to respond to that debt by being generous in his in how he treats uh, Onesimus as he comes back to him. Okay? Uh, very different kind of letter. The, it's a very personal letter. The way the, the theological premise that we take from it, which we, you know, it's not evident, we drive from it, is that this bond of brotherhood and sisterhood in Jesus Christ trumps everything else. This is the most important thing. It is more important, our brotherhood, our sharing as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ is more important than any other kind of social status or social uh, agreements or contracts or anything else that we have. That trumps everything else. Okay? And the verses that we'll look at, by 12 to 19, which is a big chunk of the whole 25 verses, <laughs> Uh, Paul writes to Philemon, I am sending him, that's Onesian, Onesimus, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am changed for the gospel. Do you hear this? Paul is a master at this kind of verbal manipulation. Not, uh, not blatant, not mean, but still. Uh, so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. Remember, he wrote this from prison. He's in prison in Rome. But I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favor you do will be spontaneous and not forced. Still is the expectation of a favor to be done. Perhaps the reason he, Anisimus, was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back for good, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. Okay? Paul was... If you ever want to read a great fundraising letter, read 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. Okay? Paul's, and, and Paul was not reluctant to, to say, you guys should feel guilty about this if you're not going to do anything. Yes, Becky. But even the part where he says, so if you consider me as a partner, it is almost saying... So you would still be in good with me. Yeah, exactly. Well, duh. Yeah. So it's it's a brilliant little twenty-five verses. Yes. Uh, but, uh, but again, there's an important point here. While he doesn't write it as with intentioning or having the intention of it being a theological tree, this is written as a personal letter. There's a very clear, important theological premise here, and that is that our relationship in Christ to one another is more important than any other social contract or status or agreement of any kind. Of and I, I believe that's why it was determined that this was part of the canon, that this is something God desired for us to have in, in the Bible. Yes, Bob? Well, it, that was a question I was just going to ask you, because to me it seems a little strange that this is a book of the Bible, mm -hmm. why it would have been considered yep. canon. Well, I think it, the, the premise there, I mean, that established... Christianity was quite unusual in that it drew a lot of people from different status, we, we, uh, status in, in society. We obviously have women of considerable means that we're told. You know, Lydia, who John Bat or uh, Paul baptizes outside Philippi, was a woman from Asia Minor who traveled in order to sell purple goods. She would have been quite wealthy, or she wouldn't have been there. Uh, we have women who took care of Jesus and, and uh, his followers who were well-to-do. We have people who are uh, women who are identified as being the wife of a proconsul at one point, and uh, very significant people of means. We also have a lot of slaves, and the reason we know that is because there's a difference between slave names and non-slave names. And so when Paul lists the people that he's writing to, or that he wants to be remembered to, or who are present, that he sends greeting, whatever, um, half of those or more are slave names. The Church of Jesus Christ attracted people from every social sense. The very wealthy, the middle class of that day, there wasn't a huge middle class, but those that were. Uh, and then the slaves. And part of what the gospel represented to them was breaking down all those barriers. That you did not hold that against people. Whenever there were that kind of uh, differentiation made, you get people like James in the gospel, of, in the, the epistle of James, saying, if you show favoritism to somebody because they're wealthy, you are violating the love of, in, of God. Okay? You, get, you get clear markings in other places, not just here that differentiation, showing favoritism because of social status or money or anything else, whatever else the world counted, that's not how we 
consider. And so this book is a perfect little illustration of that. Now, if this book were 10 chapters, and this was the whole content, then it might not have made it. But, you know, it, it has such an important message to what the church was about. It's only 25 verses. I think that that's the reason why it was included. Um, okay? All right, let's keep going here. Let's look at uh, one well, of the... Yes? Were, were the slaves... How did they become slaves? Well, they were either born into slavery because their parents were slaves, or they were captured in war and brought back as slaves, or they were uh, found guilty of an offense, and the uh, punishment for that was to be sold into slavery. Uh, for instance, if you were a debtor, if you owed money and couldn't pay it, you could be sold into slavery in order to recover the, the money for the person who uh, you owed to. So there were a number of different ways they could get there. One of the most common was, was uh, in times of defeat. You know, when Alexander the Great, when he um, uh, conquered the city of Tyre, 30,000 people were sold into slavery. All right, so the conquerors would make money off selling the people. Yes, yes. So would their names be changed then once they became slaves? Not usually. I mean, their, their name was their name. It's possible if, you know, people did change their names from time to time. But we even have uh, historical records, not biblical records, but historical records of people of some means who still maintain slave names because they, um, for instance, this has come out in a, in a couple of movies. They've talked about, uh, like the movie Spartacus, the guy who is the slave master, the one who has the slaves and trains them and everything, who's quite wealthy, was himself a slave. He had been a gladiator, and because he won, he was honored by giving, being given his freedom, but he still had his slave name. He had come from that background. And so there, um, there were cases where people could have, probably, who were no longer slaves, but they maintained their names. So, in fact, for some of them, if they had, get the sense that they had come up out of slavery and were now free, that it was almost a source of pride, the fact that they had overcome that. So they wouldn't have been that anxious to get rid of it. But I'm sure people differ than just like they do now. All right, well, let's look at the book of Philippians. The book of Philippians is one of the most, uh, in fact, the theme of Philippians is joy. And it is one of the, the, the most joyful, rejoicing, those are both words that are used over and over and over again in this book. I, I remember when I was in high school, I was a junior counselor at a Bible camp for two summers. And the, the other junior counselors, you know, everybody would write to everybody, and you, you you, could always, you always knew you were getting a letter from somebody you know from Bible camp because the mailman would stand outside for about five minutes reading the envelope because they would write scripture verses and you know and they would put <laughs> slogans and sayings all over the envelope. Okay, you could barely read the address line. Uh, and one of the things I real I noticed back then is that the most quoted uh, book of the Bible for that kind of thing, where you know just real affection, uh, kind of youthful exuberance and affection, was quoting the book of Philippians. It was everybody's favorite. It's always been one of my very favorite books because of the joy in it. The interesting thing is that Paul is writing from prison. He's writing to the Philippians who themselves are under persecution. And yet it is a book about joy. It is a book about overcoming that persecution in all humility and finding joy in the great grace that they have in Jesus Christ. So the theme is the Christ-centered life. And that the sign of that Christ-centered life is joy and rejoicing. Um, only four chapters. Each chapter has kind of a different focus, which is why, like, you know, Paul didn't write these in chapters and verses. You guys do know that, right? The Bible, the Bible chapters and verses were decided long, long after this in order for us to be able to refer to specific places. And it was, it's kind of hard to do, you know. Uh, but that allows us to say a particular verse uh, and refer people to it. The first uh, chapter, Paul is talking about his own situation, his own circumstances where he is in prison. The second chapter is he talks about the mind of Christ. The third chapter is the knowledge of Christ. And the fourth chapter is the peace of Christ, always with this sense of rejoicing and joy in all of this. Um, Paul's purpose, again, is to encourage. To encourage that he is in very much the same sort of situation in terms of persecution that the, the Philippians are experiencing and that he has joy and they should have joy. The, it is a very personal letter. All of this talk of joy and rejoicing. Paul is writing to these people that he loves. And he says, I, you know, I, I love you. I, I, I take great joy every time I think about you. 
and your fellowship in the faith. Um, it's, um, it just bubbles. <laughs> this book's wonderful. If you don't know the book of Philippians, go home and read it before you do Romans. You know, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, just a terrific letter. The whole point is that we should spend our lives focusing not on the difficulties and the discouragements and the being downtrodden and everything else, but rather we focus on the intimacy we have with God through Jesus Christ and the rejoicing that we can take in that. That that trumps everything else. That overcomes everything else. And we need to be joyous in that. A couple of verses relate to it. For me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now that sounds depressing until you realize that Paul really is saying that as an item of rejoicing. Yeah. To live is Christ. You know, this is great. And you know what? If I have to die, that's okay. Because I'll be with him. And this, so this is not a this is not a somber statement. This is a statement of rejoicing. And then from Philippians 4, 11 to 13, again, encouragement in bad times. I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength, no matter how bad it is. Yes? Uh, in the previous verses, uh, when he talks about humility, <coughs> how do you think he was defining, uh, defining Humility. How would Paul define it? Yeah, humility is a big, big topic for me. Um, it's the, the forgotten Christian virtue. Mm -hmm. That's humility. Mm -hmm. Paul would say humility means not thinking of your own needs, thinking first of the desire and will of God, and secondly of the needs of others. Okay. So humility is not put yourself first. It doesn't mean beat yourself up, or put yourself down, or saying I'm just a worm. Paul was a, was a powerful and mighty servant of God, and he knew that, and he was probably, he argued for his own apostleship, for the, own, for the significance of his ministry as one called by God. So he was not one to run himself down, but he always maintained, as does James and others, that Christian humility means God and Jesus Christ comes first, the need of other people comes second, and I come third. That's what it means to be humble. And to not, and that, that if we understand that, that subsumes everything else. It's, it's, it, it takes over my attitude about things. It, it takes over, you know, whether I get angry about stuff. I mean, because my desires and will doesn't have to come first. God's come first. And then I need to be concerned about other people second. And then I come third. Okay. That's what Christian humility is about. It is not, I'm just a worm kind of attitude. Okay. Marvin. In tying in with the joy, um, <clears throat> Also, I'm picking my wife out to her to, to dinner for her birthday. Oh, that's nice. He said, "Yeah, it's my duty." Oh, yeah. How yeah. wonderful! If he says, "Yes, it's my joy." Yeah. I'm raising my children, and they're so hard to raise, and they cost money, and there's so many aggravations and so on. You know, and you can look at it that way, and everything is dragging yourself through brambles. Absolutely. Or you can say, "They're my joy. They're my pleasure. Yeah. They're my future." You yeah. Know? Um, so, uh, us old people here, a lot of us have pets, and we just love our pets to death. It's a joy, and we don't complain about what we have to do, but we don't get that for the rest of our life. Yep. Just... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, our, some of you know that one of, you mentioned pets, one, one of our dogs, Bob, uh, Bob had a prostate tumor, had to have it removed recently. Well, he hasn't gotten better. You know, the surgeries he healed, and that's all fine, but apparently he, um, his kidneys were affected. And so just this morning, we finally got a diagnosis. I mean, he's, he's having trouble walking and all kinds of stuff. That his body is full of toxins because his, neither his kidneys nor his liver were working right. Now they think, there, there are signs that they could still do something about it. It's not that his kidneys have failed, you know. Which would be it. But we've been, I got up at 3.30 this morning and sat for two hours with him in my lap. And I don't feel bad about that. I don't, I don't, that's not a grudge, it's a joy. Yes. I love this little dog, yes. okay? Um, and I, I, we, you know, trying to coax him to eat stuff because he doesn't want to eat. We're trying different stuff, you know, and we're, and it's not, it's not a pain. It's not, it's not something we get, um, it's, it's joy. So even in the midst of 
of having difficulties, we find joy because God gives us joy in our lives. I mean, you mentioned pets. I didn't bring it up, but um, that's, so if you think about it, pray for Bob. Because <laughs> <laughs> he's a sweet. He's a, you guys, you guys know him. He's a sweet little dog, isn't he? Yes, he is. Okay. Uh, Better go on out for Carolyn Crafts. Too late. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> we now come to the three books, First and Second Timothy and Titus, which are called the pastoral epistles. The reason they're called the pastoral epistles is because, again, part of Paul's letters, his epistles, were written to specific problems in specific churches. Part of his letters were written, like Romans and Ephesians to a great extent, to larger issues that face all the churches. You've got Philemon as unique in terms of being a personal letter, but these three, 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus, are called um, the, uh, the pastoral epistles because he is teaching two of his, um, the people that he mentored, that he brought with the, up in the faith, Timothy and Titus, both of whom become leaders in the church. He is, he is talking about how to be pastors and, and issues related to the church. These are the letters, particularly 1st Timothy and Titus, that talk about what, you know, the characteristics that are necessary in an elder or in somebody who's in a position of leadership. How worship ought to be taken care of. How to deal with problems in the church. So these are the pastoral epistles. Paul is being a pastor to Timothy and Titus, and he is also instructing them on how to be a pastor in leading the church. So that's why they're called the pastoral epistles. Uh, we believe they were written after Paul's release from his imprisonment in Rome where he wrote the previous four letters, um, and he is either preparing or, or involved in what we call his fourth missionary journey, for which we have no definitive proof, but there's a strong tradition that Paul traveled to several places, including Crete, where Titus was, to Asia Minor, uh, to Ephesus, where Timothy was, and other places, Nicopolis and others, and eventually made it all the way to Spain before coming back to, um, to Troas and being arrested there, taken back to Rome, tried and executed. So, Timothy, young man whom um, we, we're introduced to in Acts because when, when Paul and Silas on the second missionary journey, when they get to Lystra and Derbe, they meet Timothy. Timothy, whose mother and grandmother are identified as having been faithful believers. He had been raised in the faith. Now, his mother was a Jewish Christian. His father was Greek. And because his father was Greek, he had not been circumcised. And it's interesting that in Timothy and Titus, we have what look like differences, because Timothy, in assisting Paul, you remember Paul almost always, when he went into a new town, he would go to the synagogue first, and he would, he would minister and preach to the Jewish people. Timothy, being an uncircumcised Jew, now, because his mother was Jewish, he's considered Jewish. You know that, that yes. Judaism, yes. the Jewish faith, is passed through the mother, not through the father. If you have a Jewish mother and a Gentile father, you're Jewish. If you have a Gentile mother and a Jewish father, you're not Jewish. So, Timothy was Jewish. He was a believer in Christ. Paul circumcised him so that he could go into the synagogues and he could witness with and minister with Paul, not because Timothy needed it, but because in order for him to be effective as a minister of the gospel, it was necessary. Okay? See the difference? Yes. Later on, when we in Titus, or we read elsewhere about Titus, he also was a, an assistant and a, a subordinate. You know, he'd been trained by Paul. There's a point at which some of the Jewish Christians insisted that Titus be circumcised because he was a Gentile, and Paul refuses. The Jews, the Jewish Christians, were claiming Titus has to be circumcised because he can't be saved without being circumcised. And Paul went, no, that's not true. He's fine the way he is. Because it wasn't an issue there, since he was ministering to Gentiles, it was not an issue of him being circumcised so that he could be received into the synagogues and listened to by the Jews. So you see that difference? This is very similar to the Jerusalem Council, who said you don't have to be circumcised or obey the law of Moses, but don't, don't have sexual immorality, don't eat food sacrificed to idols, uh, don't eat blood, don't eat you know, animals, uh, animal flesh that's been strangled, basically. They call it with the blood still in it. Because the ritual way for the Jews to kill animals was to was to bleed them, you know, to cut their throats. And all the blood had to come out, and that was part of the Jewish law. Well, James does not say that in Acts 15 in the Jerusalem Council, because people needed not to do those things in order to be saved. He said it because if you did those things, the Jews will not listen to you if you tell them about Jesus. It was an issue of witnessing. 
The same thing was true of Timothy. And so he had Timothy, he circumcised Timothy. So in writing to Timothy, um, he's dealing with some of the specific doctrinal problems that the church in Ephesus has. He's writing to Ephesus. Um, there were problems with false teaching, with apostasy. Remember, Ephesus was this, this crossroads for everything. You had the Temple of Artemis. You had all these pagan religions. You had a strong Jewish community. You were really rabid about maintaining the Jewish faith. You had all kinds of influences from everywhere. Well, the church in Ephesus suffered from that. There were a lot of efforts to try to bring in false teaching or the kind of syncretism that you also saw in Colossians, uh, with the Colossians in Colossae. So Paul is writing about that, and he wants to help, in addition to doctrinal issues, he also wants to help Timothy as a young pastor of the church in Ephesus to make sure he understands how to get the church organized and how to identify who the right leaders are. One of the things Paul did, Paul and Barnabas and Silas later, when they traveled is part of their job. They would pray and fast in appointing elders. And so Paul is trying to assist Timothy with that same thing. So the first chapter deals with uh, doctrinal questions or issues. Chapters 2 and 3 have to do with public worship. How do you conduct worship in an effective way? Chapter 4 has to do with false teachers and how to deal with them. Chapter 5 with church discipline. What do you do with those who are not obedient to the Christian faith? How do you as a church leader deal with that? And then finally, particular other pastoral duties that Timothy is called to conduct. Um, give you a couple of verses here. The first one was is for 1 Timothy 3, 14 to 16. I'm writing you these instructions so that if I am delayed, and again, this is one of the reasons that we believe that Paul is no longer in prison, because he talks about visiting. And he talks and and we know this was not written, these books were not written earlier than when he was in prison. So the suggestion clearly is that he was no longer in prison in Rome. We believe he got out, he traveled further. If I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Beyond all question, the mystery of godliness is great. He appeared in a body, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. Now this is, much of this sounds very liturgical. It sounds like the sort of thing that you would recite as liturgy in, in the church. Ephesians, parts of Ephesians are like that too. Um, I think it's Ephesians, if I remember correctly, that Paul has one run-on sentence that goes for like 16 verses. And it's believed the reason for that is because it was something he was writing as kind of a declaration that was to be read in the church. You know, it's, a, it's like a, a statement of faith kind of thing. And so there are places, and this is one of them, this section you know, um, here, probably was a, a kind of an ecclesiastical uh, statement that could be used in the church. And Paul is using it, to, he's sharing it with Timothy for, for his use. And then from 1 Timothy 6, 11 and 12, But you, man of God, flee from all this, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight for the, of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you were made, when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Now that's the last kind of inspirational, you know, be a pastor, you know, a good pastor kind of thing that Paul is saying to Timothy as a way of encouraging him. Questions about 1 Timothy? Now 1 and 2 Timothy are very different. They're written to the same person, but we'll talk about that. Before we get to 2 Timothy, we need to talk about Titus, because Titus was written in between the two. Again, fairly close to the same time period. You'll notice that we have the same date, 62 to 66, somewhere in that range. But um, we it's the tone and the content of, of 1 Timothy, then Titus, and then 2 Timothy that tells us it's a different, uh, different time. The emphasis in Titus is on doing what is good as well as classic summary of Christian doctrine. He starts out in the first chapter, similar to what he's done with, with Timothy. If remember, Timothy is in Ephesus, major city, as a pastor. Titus is on the island of, Greek, of Crete. Now, Crete was notorious as being a, um, a place of great immorality and great... In fact, you ever heard anybody call the Cretan? Yes. From the island of Crete. And that's where that comes from. In fact, an expression... Uh, let's see, I think I've got it here somewhere that they used to have. Is, well, to act like the Cretan was an idiom which meant to play the liar, 
Uh, Crete and Cret, I'm not exactly sure. I've heard it pronounced both ways. Um, Crete is the island, it still could be Cret, I'm not sure. Cretan. Um, and they talk about the fact there was a, a slogan that all Cretans are liars and thieves and, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so it was a horrible place in terms of they say that nobody, you know, people in, on Crete would do anything for a profit. Anything for a profit. Well, Titus is the elder there. Okay, he's, the, he's in charge of the church there. And so, or he's, he's kind of a bishop, he's like senior elder. So Paul is giving him instructions on first how to appoint elders and then setting things in order. In other words, how do you get the church above all of that? Not get sucked into all of the kinds of uh, awful things that the people who lived on that island were prone to. So Paul is giving Titus a very clear sense of what his role and responsibility is for organizing the church, for supervising the church, in a very difficult circumstance, simply because of the immorality and the difficulties that, that culture had. Um, that's why the emphasis on doing what is good, as well as classic summaries of Christian doctrine, because the nat natural order there was not to do things that are good. It was to be drawn into notorious and untruthful and immoral kinds of conduct. All right? um, a verse for Titus from chapter 3. Verses 3 to 8, at one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another, which is kind of a description apparently of what it was like on the island of Crete. But, but when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things. There's the pastoral part. I want you to stress these things, so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. So, on Crete, even though the whole culture of Crete tended to be immoral and money-driven and everything else, as a pastor there, Titus, your job is to make sure that the people who become Christians, believers in Jesus, that they understand they have a different set of standards they have to obey. Uh, that they need to focus on doing what is good. Okay? Yes? I just want to comment that um, the verses that uh, you've been reading uh, all throughout from the start of our studies uh, still minister to us. Mm -hmm. You know, as you read them and as we as we can read up there, it's just right. um, it's wonderful. Well, I, you know, it's it's difficult to pick key verses and say this is the best one right. yeah. because because <laughs> yes. there's a lot of good stuff. I mean, I could give you ten pages of best verses from from any of these books, but I do try to pick one or two, and not just me. I mean, I have sources that I look at as well that direct me, that sometimes I. I, I have to choose the ones that I think are best. But, excellent. Uh, yeah, the, the, this is powerful stuff. I think Paul knew what he was talking about himself. That's what he <laughs> so, yes, right. How do you handle when somebody says to you, well, Paul had a thing for, I mean, he basically is Christianity according to Paul. Uh, all the rules and, and all the, his, he, he had certain likes and dislikes, and they go back in history and find out certain things. How do we, I mean, we believe the word is inspired by God, so therefore we believe that Paul was inspired by God, although it's never really, other than when he was saved, he, he, he doesn't say, God told me, God spoke to me, like, you know, in the Old Testament. You know? Actually, he does. Yeah. There's one place where Paul says, when he's talking about not getting married, he says, now, this is just my opinion. And the very clear implication is, as opposed to the other things I've told you, which are from God. Okay. Um, and, and we even have a passage in Peter where, he's, where he refers to the writings of his brother Paul, I mean his, his, his co-laborer Paul, as being um, the new scripture, as being canon, as being from God for our sakes. Okay. So the, even... Even in their lifetime, in Paul and Peter's lifetime, people were already beginning to acknowledge that this stuff that Paul was writing wasn't just Paul's opinion. It wasn't just his idea. And the fact that at one place Paul says, okay, I'm just telling you what Paul thinks here. This is not from God. 
Now, my opinion. exactly, and I think I mentioned once before, or maybe last week, that it was a few years ago, they always pick the most important characters in history. And for some reason, they feel like they need to change those from time to time, you know, even though they're always back then, you know, that, is it Alexander the Great or who is it? Uh, well, Jesus has been selected fairly often, not so much recently, but a few years ago, it's been probably a decade or more ago now, because time flies. Um, they chose the Apostle Paul, and their explanation for that was that Paul's the one who created Christianity, not Jesus. And Jesus was this itinerant preacher in Palestine. It's Paul that created Christianity. Well, um, find anything that we have record of Jesus saying, and show me where that's contradictory to what Paul says. Okay? So that's my response to people, is if you can show me how Paul is not consistent. Now, yes, we believe that God ordained Paul as the one to flesh things out, to explain it. To communicate it, to pass it on. Jesus never left, you know, he never left Palestine. Um, and yet it was God's will that more people hear about it than that. And Paul was one of the primary people, not the only one. I mean, you also have Peter, you have John, and you have others who in various ways influenced, influenced the, the growth of the, of the faith. But find anything that, that we have record of Jesus that's not consistent with Paul. Um, and I would say, wow, that's quite something. And I don't think there is anything, not unless you have people have kind of a wild liberal interpretation, like saying, oh, I don't think this was Paul. Paul didn't really say that. Or, you know, Paul <coughs> says that Jesus... said that because of the time that he was in right. and what was happening in that. Right. Or Paul declared that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God, and, and Jesus never said that about himself. Really? I don't think you've read this stuff, people who say that. You know, let me show you half a dozen places where Jesus either actually said it about himself or somebody else said it about him to his face and he didn't bother to correct them. Okay. So, yeah, people will make that kind of claim um, because they don't want to accept the truth of it. We believe that this is completely consistent with what Jesus had to say and that he was anointed by God to teach it, to expand, to carry that message out. And that necessarily required that he, you know, he not just quote. Okay. Did somebody raise a hand? Carol. Well, I don't know if this is going back to your original question or not, but um, Paul did talk about having visions a lot, mm -hmm. didn't he? And right. He was taking them into the seventh heaven exactly. and all that stuff. Um, well, his very vision of Christ. Yeah. I mean, but he, he seemed to be in communication with God quite a bit. He did, he did. Yeah, he was listening. In a special way. Well, and the other thing is that, you know, uh, again, Paul did not write the book of Acts. So our whole sort of timeline of history, including the the divine vision that Paul had of Jesus on the road to Damascus, and the miraculous events that occurred, you know, where he struck the sorcerer uh, Elinus blind, and he drove the, you know, the prophetic servant out of the slave girl in Philippi, and, and on and on and on. Paul's not the one who wrote that. There were other people witnessing and testifying to those events. So you can't just put it all on Paul and say, you know, he, he was too big for his riches. Everybody else was saying, Paul, you got pretty good riches. Um, <laughs> Anything else about that? We've got one more book to look at. And that is the book of 2 Timothy. And as I say, there's a very different tone about this. We believe that the book of 2 Timothy was written in 66-67, while Paul is in prison in Rome for the second time. When you read this book of 2 Timothy, um, there's a somberness to it. Paul, I read it, and it seems very clear to me that Paul knows... He's not going to be let out of prison again. Uh, that his work is done. You know, he talks about having run the good race. You know, his time is finished. Um, and because his time is short, he's writing to Timothy, who's one of the ones he's closest to. Now, Timothy and Titus both get mentioned a bunch of times, not only in Acts, but in Paul's other writings. They were both very important to him. Um, and in this, in this letter, Paul asked Timothy to come to visit him in Rome if he can. Um, and he, he, but he gives him, a, you read all of this, and it gets the feeling like, okay, this is my last message to you. A very different sense than you get from the other letters. He talks about Timothy being careful to maintain the gospel during the persecution under the Emperor Nero that's occurred, and he asks him to communicate um, his, you know, his love and affection and his messages to the church in Ephesus. So he talks about persevering in the present testing because this was when the full-blown persecution of Nero had occurred. I remember Nero tried to blame the, the Christians for the burning of Rome when every historian knows that Nero ordered Rome to be set on fire because he wanted to destroy it because he was an egotist and he, you know, and it's a maniacal egotist. Um, 
and he wanted to rebuild Rome the way he wanted it to be built. But he had to blame somebody, so nobody would hold it against him, so he blamed the Christians. And so his persecution was based upon that. And that was in full bore at this time. Then we have, in addition to persevere for the present testing, Paul talks to Timothy about the fact that, you know, this isn't going to be over quick. There is going to be future persecution. We need to be prepared for it. We need to accept it. Um, and there, there are going to, there's going to be, he talks about the day of apostasy, the day in which people, the persecution will cause people to turn away. And that uh, Timothy needs to be a faithful minister. He needs to preach the word. He needs to be prepared to make sure that he's strengthening people during this time. It's, going to, it's tough now. It's going to get even worse as the persecution spreads. And then, um, at the very end, he, Paul, very clearly seems to be saying, you know, my death is coming very soon. Um, and so there's a somberness about this that you don't get in a lot of the other materials. All right? Two verses. 2 Timothy 2, 1-4. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable men who, who will also be qualified to teach others. This idea of making sure that the message passes on, that the leadership passes on. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. In other words, stay focused. Okay? And then 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you have learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. He's trying to encourage him, to anchor him uh, in Scripture and in the, in the faith. He never thought of his letter in Scripture. Um, he never calls him that. Whether he thought of him as that or not, I don't know. He yes, certainly... Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, Peter refers to him as that, as they say, but uh, at least some of his letters. But Paul certainly believed he was speaking the word of God. You know, whether he even thought about whether or not this is going to be canon or not. Canon, the word canon, which is from canon, the, the Greek word that means the ruler, the, the, literally the yardstick. It's, those are the books of scripture that have been accepted by the church as being a word from God by which we are to measure and direct our lives. Not just good stuff, God fine teaching, etc., etc., but this is from God, you know, given through uh, leaders in the church for our sake, so that we will know how God wants us to live. That's what canon means. Right? Any questions about 2 Timothy? <coughs> any questions about any of the things we've talked about so far, any of the books of Paul? I know you've all read them all by now, so 